So we are still in Romans, as we will be for probably the rest of this decade. But that's all right. We're gonna be we're gonna be thorough. We're gonna be thorough. Yes. Uh, before we get going in that, anything else that's on your minds is this, that uh, you want to uh, yak about uh, at this particular moment in time? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. Samuel 2.8. Okay. okay. David defeated Moab. Right. And measured them with the line. Uh-huh. Making them lie down on the ground. And he measured two lines to put to death. And one line, one full line to keep alive. What are the lines? What are the lines? Hang on a minute. Let me look at the context. Who, yeah. What First Samuel 2, what did you say? No, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 8, 2. Okay. On my page is 504. Okay. Um, look at the context. David's triumphs, okay. Defeated uh, all these people, right? And hamstrung the horse, okay. Da 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 da. Uh, Well, um, he simply, what he did is he uh, left one-third alive. That's what it's basically saying. He lined everybody up, and uh, I'm assuming equal lines, and uh, uh, three equal lines, and uh, put to death two of the lines and kept one alive. alive. That, that's what I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. Line of the men. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unless the context talks about uh, territory or whatever, that would be measuring line, would be a measuring line of, uh, of uh, like a boundary line. But there's no, there's no reference to property or, or uh, boundaries or anything like that um, in here. So uh, I am assuming that this is just a, lined them up and made, uh, again, I'm assuming three equal lines uh, of the survivors and uh, put to death two of the line, two of the group, two of the, line, two of the uh, bunches and uh, preserved one. That's the simplest explanation I can think of. Mm -hmm. So the line might be a, a rope of some sort or something, measuring line. Well, it, it could be, it could be a measuring line, but but uh, what would be the point of that? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, measuring lines were used uh, in uh, architecture, uh, building, uh, and in uh, uh, measuring... Um, uh, Property. Well, yeah, you know, a certain uh, certain distances and things like that. But yeah, yeah. But, but uh, in this case, since we're talking about defeating somebody and talking about uh, obviously the survivors, then obviously I'm thinking let's just make a, make a line of people, uh, three equal lines, kill off two of them. So they're not gonna, you know, and this, this, is, this was common I think in those days that, that uh, uh, you would, uh, you would uh, make it so that your enemy, in this case Moab, make it so that you, you didn't want them to disappear entirely. You didn't want to wipe them out entirely, unless, of course, God told you to, mm -hmm. which in some cases God did. But, but you didn't want to wipe them out entirely because you have to have somebody take care of that land next to you. You don't want, you don't want the land next to you, the country next to you, to go fallow, you know, and be just overrun with, with uh, who knows what, you know, uh, weeds and things and bandits and 
and and stuff like that. So you you let them let some of them live, but you do don't want them to be as powerful as they were before. And so you would uh, you would uh, kind of like kind of like the Romans, you know, when the Romans wanted to punish uh, uh, a group of their soldiers because they didn't fight well in battle, or, or even because they retreated when they weren't supposed to, they would do a decimation. They would ever have everybody count off one to ten, one to over again, over and over again, and then pick a number, and uh, number four, you know, okay, all the number fours step out, and then kill them all. That's a, That's to decimate somebody is to kill one tenth of of the a legion, and uh, they would do that if the legion misbehaved in battle. Uh, they would do that. So. Uh, again, you you want to you want to you, you uh, weaken uh, in the case of enemies. You want to weaken the enemies, but you don't want to wipe them out entirely. Yeah, because you, if you wipe them out entirely, uh, what you, who's going to take care of the problem? Exactly. That, that's that's and, what I'm saying. And yeah. And also, if you don't have them working, you're going to have to feed them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Have... yeah. Right. You don't want that either. Yeah, that's true. That. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? All right. We pick it up in uh, chapter 5, one of those uh, wonderful chapters of, of Romans. 5 and 8 are the two, two most uh, quoted uh, chapters in Romans. So we pick it up at verse 12. Paul continues, Therefore, just as though as through one man sin entered the world, meaning Adam, and death, through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. Now, now when he says until the law, he's talking about until the Ten Commandments were given on Mount Sinai. Okay? And, and the rest of the law, too. So until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Okay. So what God basically says, saying here, he's not holding people responsible for breaking the law when they didn't know the law. He didn't impute that to them. Nevertheless, you could say, on the other hand, death reigned from Adam till Moses. So, so we're, what we're concentrating on right, right here is the period from the fall to uh, Exodus to, to the time of Moses receiving the word uh, on the mountain, uh, Mount, Mount, Mount uh, Sinai. Okay, that, that's concentrated. But Paul wants to use this as an example. Okay, so God's not holding people accountable. He's not imputing the sin of Adam on those people or, or, or their, their actual sins on, on those people. He's not punishing them. Okay, for sin, not holding them accountable. Don't, don't think of it any more than that. Don't overthink it. The fact of the matter is that God doesn't impute a sin technically to anyone because he has imputed it to his son. See? But, but he's talking about what you see, what you experience. So He's saying that people still died, but they didn't die as a punishment of sin. They died as a consequence of the fall. That is because of the change in our bodies and the change in the world. Okay? The environment of the world became more hostile, especially after the Great Flood. And our bodies uh, changed, changed immediately at the time of the fall to not be immortal anymore. Because God said, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's what happened. The change happened instantaneously. Adam and Eve's bodies went from immortal bodies to mortal bodies instantly. They went from bodies that would never die, made, created not to die. Adam and Eve were created to live forever. They went from that 
instantly, as soon as they sinned, their bodies now became mortal. That is, they would die at some point. And as time went on, and again, especially because of the flood, the lifespan of people got shorter and shorter and shorter. Till you get to the time of Jesus, and like I say, if you're 50, you're lucky, you're considered old. And that was pretty much true throughout the Middle Ages until fairly recently. So uh, that's what he's saying. He's saying, so, so these, the people died, yes, but it was not because of sin. God did not impute the sin to them. Okay? Did not, did not hold them accountable is a better translation, I think. Okay? So, nevertheless, okay, so death reigned, okay, just as it does today. Even, those, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So Adam is a type of Christ. Not in his behavior as far as sin is concerned, but in the fact that what he does affects all humans. You have to keep this straight, otherwise you're going, to, you're going to get messed up as Paul goes along here. You've got to keep focus on what, Paul, what the point Paul is making. Adam is a type of Christ only in the sense that whatever happens to Adam happens to all humans. Whatever happens to Christ happens to all humans. Okay? That's, that's what's going on here. Right? Now, when he says that uh, those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, Okay. Adam was uh, an unbeliever for a moment, maybe even hours, who knows. The fact of the matter is, all sin comes from unbelief, lack of faith, in one way or another. What Paul is saying here is that uh, Adam lost faith, he became an unbeliever. All right. So those who sinned who, who sinned, but they did not sin in the likeness of the offense of Adam. In other words, these are believers, okay? These are believers who sinned, okay? but not in unbelief. So they're like us. We're believers, but we sin every day. So that's only, all, again, that's all Paul's saying. You don't read into it any more than that. So again, he's talking about this period of time. He wants to use this as an example. It was time without the written word. There was no uh, inspired word. There may have been written accounts of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so on and so forth, of the flood and whatever. That's true. It may have been. I don't know. Most commentators think there probably were. The point is, it was not inspired. It was not inspired until God spoke to Moses on the mountain for those 40 days. Right? So, it, so Paul's, Paul's making an example here. He's saying, okay, look at... Look at the world before the law came, before inspired, before the Bible, okay? So before the Bible was available, all right, what did we have? We had uh, the fall. We had Adam's fall caused all people uh, to be guilty of sin. Adam's fall called all people to die, right? But... Just like with other, the other case where there was, when there was a Bible, the sin's not imputed. Why is it not imputed? It's not imputed because it's going to be, or it, in God's mind, has already been imputed to Christ. So far, so good. And yet the people are still dying. Why are they dying? They're dying as a consequence. Keep that in mind. So when, when uh, let's say, something negative something bad, something unpleasant, something uh, uh, hurtful, whatever happens, we cannot jump to the conclusion this is a punishment for sin because that's not what it was in that period of time either. It was a consequence. It was a consequence of the fact that their bodies became mortal rather than immortal. And so people died. And that was even true of the believers. So even... If you wanted to summarize it real easy, this verse is just saying, in those days, even believers died. Everybody died, including believers. Okay? Like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They died. Okay? That's really all he's saying. So you can't, you can't blame that on sin. It's, it's, 
Well, it's on it's on the fall, yes. It's on it's on Adam's sin as far as that, but it's not for their particular sin. Their their sin is not imputed to them. Carolyn, did you have a question? After Adam thought his, he, he didn't have a say and sin, then he after God said, okay, they became mortal, mm -hmm. did Adam become a believer? Yes. Well, no, we don't know exactly when. We don't know exactly at what precise point Adam's faith returned, but it did. It, it, it returned, Eve too, it returned. Uh, the, the, the best... The best guess, if you want to call it that, or 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 the the most most people in look at the the fall story, and when God's speaking to them, they're still kind of uh, they're still unbelievers, maybe. Uh, but you know, when when God's talking to them, you know, where are you? Well, you know, here we are. Uh, we were afraid of you. Okay, it, it, you fear fear of God. That kind of fear, the 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 the, the abject fear of God is is again from unbelief. Okay? But then, and then God says, here's the consequences of your, of your unbelief. And one of the first consequences, he says, is I'm going to send a Savior. I, you know, you're going to have a, a, a child, Eve, or down the road anyway, a descendant, a descendant. You're going to have a descendant, okay, who is going to crush uh, the devil. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, remove uh, your sin. Now, as soon as they heard that, did they become believers again? I don't know. It's certainly possible. And then God outlines the rest of the consequences. The uh, hardship in earning a living, the uh, pain and, and difficulty in, in bearing and raising children, and so on and so forth. And then we see, uh, we follow them along, and we see that uh, they, they must have had faith because... Uh, she bears uh, a son, Cain, which she says is, she thinks, she thinks God meant her firstborn child is going to be the Savior. Uh, and that, that, we don't, you can't blame her for coming to that conclusion. You, you, know, you, don't, you don't know the big picture yet. So um, she must have had faith by that time, otherwise she would not have said, I have, I have had a son and he is God. He is the Lord. He is the Messiah. Okay. She would not have said that if she did not believe in a Messiah. So she's a believer by that point, certainly. All right. So what, what God is, what, what Paul is pointing out here is simply that death comes to both believers and unbelievers, and the sin is not imputed to believers or unbelievers. Whether there's a Bible or not makes no difference in, in those two instances. Okay. Whether they're believers or not doesn't matter. They're still going to die, unless, of course, Christ returns. Okay, so that's 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 what he's getting at here. Okay, and he then brings it brings it back to what he's talking about as far as uh, salvation and the process of salvation. Remember what he's fighting against. He's fighting against this idea that people are saved because of who they are. I am a Jew, therefore I am saved. I don't have to do nothing else. I am a Jew. I am a child of Abraham, therefore I'm saved. He's fighting against that, or he's also fighting against the idea, I did X amount of good works, therefore I'm saved. That's what he's trying to, he's trying to knock that down. So he's going all the way back to the beginning. And he's saying, okay, just as in this case, as we'll see as, as we go on here, the same is for salvation. Notice what the very next thing he says. The free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, how much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus, abound to the many. So in one sense, the, uh, the use of Christ and Adam is the same in that in Adam all died. In Christ, all, are, all sins are paid for. So in that sense, they are the, the same. But in the uh, sense of uh, uh, the death being the uh, consequences, the consequences of Christ is eternal salvation. So you could say life. Now you pass through physical death, yes, that's true. Again, in Christ, unless Christ returns. 
but you don't die eternally. See, that's that's the that's the point he's making here. So even though Adam and Christ are the same as far as what happens to them applies to everybody, all right? In Adam's case, it's all negative. It's sin and the consequences of sin. In uh, Jesus' case, it's not the same. In Jesus' case, it's the payment of sins and the consequences of that payment. Okay? The consequences of the payment is the sin is removed. Now, we're not talking yet about here about believers or unbelievers yet. We're just saying that the, in, in Adam, everybody is guilty. That's what we call original sin. So in Adam, everybody's guilty. In Christ, everybody's exonerated. Okay? That's, that's the point he's making. Let's follow him along. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. Again, not, not in the sense that it's not applicable to everybody. That's not, that's, that is the same. That, that part is correct. But what's the result? Okay? Through the one who sinned, for on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression. So again, Adam's one sin. And, and note that it's not Eve, it's Adam. Eve sinned first, we would say, in chronological order. But the Bible never speaks of that as the original sin. They always speak of Adam's sin as the original sin, not Eve, even though, again, in, chronol in, time, in time sequence, Eve sinned before Adam. Now, does that mean God did not count Eve's action as sin? No. But, he, but God did not count Eve's sin as applicable to all humans. He only counted Adam's sin as applicable to all humans. Why? There's a basic difference between Eve's sin and Adam's sin. Eve's was a sin of ignorance. Paul says later to Timothy that Eve was fooled. She was tricked into sinning. Whereas Adam sinned with eyes wide open. He sinned on purpose. His rebellion was a very much a direct rebellion against God. Whereas Eve's sin was a sin of ignorance, foolishness, you could even say stupidity if you wanted to. So it was not as much of a full rebellion. It was a rebellion because all sin is rebellion. But it was not like Adam's sin, which was a full out, he knew exactly what he was doing. Eve was tricked. She was fooled. So she doesn't really realize what she's doing, and she doesn't really realize the consequences. Adam realizes the consequences. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he knows exactly why he's doing it, and he knows exactly what it's going to result in, and he does it anyway. That's why Adam's sin is the original sin, not Eve's sin. Okay? So on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression. That's it. Adam's sin, resulting in condemnation. So that's across the board again. But on the other hand, the free gift, which is grace, arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. So the, uh, all the transgressions, all the sins of the whole world are put on Christ. And because the transgressions of the whole world are put on Christ, then that means Justification for the whole world. Can't be anything else. Has to be. Otherwise, how do many sins produce justification? The only way many, which in Paul's words here means all, what, what, do they, what, what happens to them? Well, they get paid off on the cross. It, well, in the Passion and the, on the cross, they, they get paid off. They're gone. They don't exist anymore. As far as God is concerned, they're wiped out. Okay. 
He goes on, for if by the transgression of the one, Adam, death reigned through that one, Adam, much more those who receive the abundance of grace, which is everybody, and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, Jesus Christ. So what applies to one applies to the other. What happens to uh, what ha- what Adam does applies to everybody else. What Jesus does applies to everybody else. Now he's not talking about faith yet. He hasn't brought that up yet. That's coming. He wants to establish this this uh, um, principle first. What happens to Adam applies to everybody. What happens to Christ applies to everybody. That's that's the point he wants he's trying to make here. Just as in before there was a Bible, everybody still died. See? That's the point. That's why he brought that up. So it applies to everybody. Doesn't, doesn't matter whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. Whether you sinned in in total unbelief and rebellion and hatred of God, or whether you sinned as a believer. Uh, as a mistake or a trick or, or a foolie or whatever you want to call it. doesn't matter. doesn't matter whether you send as a believer or an unbeliever. It applies to everybody. You're all going to die, but that sin is not imputed to you. And then as he explains the next couple of verses, why is that? Because the sin is laid on Christ. Again, we're not talking about uh, faith yet. Faith is out of the question. These things, ha- these things are true whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. Okay, this is why I keep saying over and over and over again, you don't go to hell for your sins. You can't. Because you're wiped out. They're gone. It's not part of the equation. Okay. So far, so good? All right. Let's go on. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. In this case, men means people. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life for all men. So the justification is established. Everybody should, yes, everybody should go to heaven. That's right. That's right. That's God's intention. Why do we know that? Because it even says in the Bible, God would have all people to be saved. Right? Right. Okay? So again, we're, we're, not, we're not talking about faith. We're not talking about, you know, the last judgment or, you know, appearing before God, judgment seat. Not yet. He's going one step at a time here. And it's really important we remember that and not get it confused. Okay? I, I know it, it sounds, it sounds uh, too easy or too good or, or, or it doesn't sound quite right when you hear you know, that what applies to all people, the original sin, the salvation or the, uh, the redemption of Christ applies to all people. And it sounds like, it sounds, when, when you read it, it sounds as though everybody's going to be saved. Well, everybody should be saved. That's the beauty of the plan, see? The beauty of God's plan of salvation is that, yes, it, it covers everybody. There's nobody left out. And as far as the plan is concerned, as far as the plan is concerned, yes, everybody should go to heaven. Right. That's the plan. Okay. Now, it didn't work out that way. Why? Is it God's fault? No. The plan was perfect. Nothing wrong with the plan. The plan was great. Where's the problem? Well, the problem is obviously with people. There's where the problem is, which he'll deal with as we go along here. Okay. So as for as though the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, and again, many here is all. It's it's a common usage of the word that Paul Paul uses very often. Jesus himself uses it. <clears throat> Even so, through the obedience of the one, and, and here again, folks, it can't really be any more clear whether we don't understand it or whether we don't like it or or whether it sounds too too liberal for us, okay? 
is, is not the point. It can't be more clear. Um, righteousness of one result in justification for all men. Next one, next verse, the end of the next verse. The obedience of one, many will be made righteous. I, I don't see it can be any clearer than that, folks. It just can't be. Through the fall of Adam, everybody is counted as guilty. Through the sacrifice of Christ, everybody is counted as innocent. I mean, you really can't get it any clearer than that. So, you know, I, in, in, uh, in, in conservative Lutheranism especially, there's a lot of angst, a lot of consternation over this because you'll have a lot of pastors and a lot of theologians and stuff saying, well, that, 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 well now that's not true. That's not true because everybody's not, everybody's not saved. And so then they'll jump from that, which is true. Well, then they'll jump from that and say, well, then they're not justified either. They're not declared righteous either. No. Yes, they are. They are declared righteous. They are declared forgiven. Yes, they are. They have to be. How, how else can you understand these words? You can't understand these words any other way. You can't will be made righteous. The only reason he uses the future there is uh, because uh, uh, the, the idea of, of the fall and all that kind of stuff, uh, it has to look forward to Christ on the cross. But in, in God's time, of course God doesn't have any time, it's all done deal. Okay. It's, all, it's all finished. It's all completed. So, uh, uh, even though it rankles us, you know, it, it feels uncomfortable to us to say that, you know, that all the sinners in the whole world, all the terrible, terrible, evil people that, that we've heard of, you know, people who are, are uh, like I said in the pulpit Sunday, Buddhists and Confucianists and whatever else, you know, that the sacrifice of Christ applies to them, and because it applies to them, they are declared uh, righteous. They are as pure and as driven snow in God's eyes. That, that, is, that, sounds, that sounds to us, no, it can't be. And, and it's because of our brains, our logical human thinking. Because we know those people go to hell. But the only reason we know that is because faith is coming down the road. We're not talking about faith yet. We're just talking about the, the plan, the process. What's the process? The process is God declares everybody guilty of, from Adam, God declares everybody innocent for Christ. That's the process. That's the plan. Now, the fact that it's not going to work out that way, again, is that, that comes to, again now, and then we talk about faith. And, and then, then who's, whose fault is it? Well, as we'll see, it's not God's fault. Because the plan is perfect. Nothing wrong with the plan. The, the problem is human beings. That's did you have a question. Yeah. <laughs> when he talks about the rich man not being able to get into heaven, it'd be easier for a mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Why did he separate the, the rich man versus the murderer versus the other? It all has to do with belief or not belief in Christ. Yeah. And the rich man, he believes in his money more so than his Okay, Let, let's, uh, let's, that's an that's a excellent question. That's an excellent question. Let's look at some, another story rather than the camel and the eye of a needle one because that's just very brief. Let's look at a longer story. Let's go back to the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Okay? Let's go. Everybody remember the story. Okay? Jesus is telling a parable, and the point of the parable is the end when Jesus says, you have the Bible, you have Moses and the prophets, that's where you get salvation. Okay? That, that's, that's, how you wind up, that's how you wind up in heaven, is through, through the Bible, through the Word of God, the means of grace. Okay? Because they give you faith. So that's going to be, that's going to be the tertium, that's going to be the point of the parable. All parables have points. Now, in this particular case, we don't know if it's a parable or it's a real story. I happen to think it's a real story. I happen to think that Jesus is... Because he doesn't start out the story as the kingdom of God is like. Or faith is like. Or the church is like. 
He doesn't do that. This is the only time he doesn't do that in all of his parables. I don't include this as a parable. I include this as an account, a historical account that Jesus t- just uses because of his knowledge as God, he uses. Right? Now it has some has some <laughs> has some problems in it because of that. But 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 let's set those aside for a second. Right now, let's just concentrate on two things. Let's just concentrate on the two people, Lazarus and the rich man. Okay? Lazarus dies, he goes to heaven, the bosom of Abraham, where he is soothed and comforted, and everything's wonderful and cool and everything like that. The rich man dies, he goes to hell. And he's in torment. Right? And through God's arrangement of the story, he allows the rich man to see Lazarus in heaven. Now, I believe this is an exception. It's not the rule, but it's an exception, right? Still, let's set that aside for a minute. Let's not worry about that. Okay. But anyway, he does. And he asks Abraham, he asks Abraham to send Lazarus to cool the tip of his tongue. And then Abraham says, Nope, not going to do it. There is a big wide gap between heaven and hell that can't be crossed. Okay. Well, obviously God could cross it if He wants to, but anyway, as far as as far as the spirits are concerned, the people are concerned, it, it's not it's not uh, possible. Okay, so so He says, uh, I can't, sorry, I can't do that. Right. And he says, to explain that, he says, you had good things in your life, and that you had your payoff. You, you had your reward while you were living. Lazarus was a bum. He was sick. He was homeless. Dogs, you know, took care of him. He went to heaven. And he says, now, even though Lazarus had a rotten life, now he's got a great eternity. Now ask yourself this question. Based upon everything you know from the Bible, based upon all the doctrine that you've learned and catechism and everything else, what in those verses, specifically in those verses says from God Himself, and we can say Abraham speaking for God, okay? Or Jesus too in his comments. Okay. What specifically is said in that story that could tell you why the rich man is in hell? Because he didn't give anything to the poor needy person. How can that be? He wouldn't even give him the scrap of the tip over the gun. How do we know that? Does it say that? Does it say that? That's what I understand. That's what... No, it doesn't. doesn't. No, okay. It doesn't say that he didn't give him the scraps from the table. Okay. It doesn't say that. But even if that's true, let's say he was the meanest man on earth. Let's say he would give Ebenezer Scrooge a run for his money. Yeah. <laughs> Is that why people go to hell? He's not a believer. Where does it say he's an unbeliever? He obviously recognizes Abraham. Right? He's a Jew. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was bar mitzvah. He, he learned the word. Okay? Probably had a special seat in the synagogue. I guarantee you he did. Right? So went to church every Saturday. Okay? As far as we know, Nothing in the Bible says, including the camel comment, nothing in the Bible says that it's impossible to go to heaven if you're rich. And it's a good thing because most of us Americans would be considered pretty rich by historic standards. There's nothing. The Bible is very clear, isn't it? It's only unbelief that damns. Where does it say in there that this man was an unbeliever? It doesn't. The only thing you can argue is that 
God knows what he's doing. God put him in hell for a reason. And so we have to assume that's all you can do. We have to assume that the reason he's in hell is because he's an unbeliever. And God knew that. And God knew that. We can't assume anything else. We can't assume that he was a mean guy. We can't even assume that, that he was a Satan worshiper in life. We can't assume that he kicked dogs, uh, you know, and uh, drowned little puppies and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, twirled cats around the, uh, his head on a string. You know, we, we can't assume that. We have no right to assume that, none whatsoever. All we can argue, the only thing we can argue from is argue from the fact that he is in hell and we know that only unbelievers go to hell. Okay. So, so look at what Paul's saying here and apply it to the same people. Why is Lazarus in heaven? That was the second question I was going to ask. So there are two questions. Why is the rich man in hell? Can't be because he's a bad guy. It's impossible. And why is Lazarus in, uh, in heaven? Could it be because he's poor? No, it can't, can it? Maybe he was just as much of a schnook. Maybe he's poor because, maybe he's laying there by the gate because he's lazy. Maybe God gave him all kinds of talents and abilities that he didn't want to do because he just didn't want to work. Could be. Huh, probably is. So how is this guy in heaven? Because he's such a goody two-shoes? No. For all we know, he's as bad, if not worse, than the rich man, as far as his outward actions are concerned. So why is he in heaven? Again, the only thing we can say is, believers go to heaven. God knew he was a believer. Of course, the other thing we can say is, here's an unbeliever does really well in the world, and here's a believer who does really, really poor in the world. Which, of course, is a whole other lesson, but that lesson is, just because you're a believer doesn't mean you'll have a, a bed of roses in life. Yes, ma'am. The rich man wasn't a believer, it's because he wanted his Lazarus to go back to his right. Yes, right. Abraham said they had Moses as a prophet. Yes, and he said, Oh, we have to have somebody else. And he goes, If they do not listen uh -huh. to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Right. Well, Moses and the prophets had the prophets. notice what he said if they don't listen. He was worried that they might not listen. Does that say anything about him? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, that, that you get from later on too. But, but folks, the, the the point the point is that in some of these parables, and this one in particular, and again, I don't think it's a parable. I think it really happened. But but the 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 point is that that the, the, what Jesus is saying is, is, is still true, that you get belief and, and faith and, and in the resurrection and other things from Moses and the prophets, that is, from the Bible, from the Word of God. The, the, the point of that story is the Bible. That's the point of the story. The point of the story is not how people get to heaven and hell. That's, that's you get that from other parts of the Bible. Okay? Don't use the story of, don't ever use the story of Lazarus the rich man to prove to somebody how and why people go to heaven and hell. Because it's not, it doesn't fit. That's not the purpose of the story. The purpose of the story is to show how you get faith. How you become a believer is from Moses and the prophets or from the Bible. And it's the same thing about the comment about the camel and the eye of a needle and all that. The point, okay, the point is what Jesus says the point is, not what we make it sometimes. It has nothing to do with rich people going to hell because they're mean or whatever, if they are. Okay? If we're talking about Elon Musk or we're talking about Zimmerman uh, or Zuckerberg or we're talking about Bill Gates, or what, it doesn't matter whether they're mean and nasty and don't give any money to charity or whether they give all their money to charity. That's not the stinking point. Okay? That isn't it. 
Okay? In the camel, the, the idea is you, you, if, you're, if you're weighed down with nothing but worries about uh, this life and acquiring more stuff, okay, you, you, then, then again, what are you saying? You're, what you're really saying is, I got I to gotta do it myself, but I don't trust God to do it, which is what, both? Unbelief. Unbelief, right, exactly. That's the story, that's the point of that story. It's not, you can't be wealthy. That's not the point of any of the stories in the Bible. Because if that was true, then Solomon would be in hell. And the Bible's clear, that's not the case. He's declared a hero of faith. David was rich too, for that matter. So was Abraham. He was very rich. He was exceedingly rich. So was, I, and so was Isaac. So was Jacob. So was Joseph. And they all are in heaven, according to the Bible itself. So folks, be very, 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 very careful. When you get to the parables and stories of Jesus that he uses to illustrate points, be very careful that you don't just assume that, well, the rich man is in hell because he's a rich man. And it was a mean miser or whatever. And Lazarus is in, in heaven because, oh, poor Lazarus, you know, and he was such a neat guy. He was such a wonderful fellow. No, they could have both been real schnooks. They could have both been absolute jerks in their life. The difference is one's a believer, one's an unbeliever. And the only way we, we don't know that from the story, the only way we know that is from where they ended up. <laughs> Joe, do you have a question? Yeah. 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 I could see, I think you'd see that. Right. 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 And, 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 yeah, and, and what does he say? Give all of your property to the poor, and then what does he say? Follow me. So where's the problem? Is the problem that, and he went away sorrowing because he was very rich. And so what was his concern? He didn't go away sorrowing because it was hard to follow Jesus. I would say if it would have said that, if, it, if, the, if, if the, the, the gospel writer or Holy Spirit would have said, he went away sorrowing because it was very hard to follow Jesus in those days, I would say, here's a believer who has weak faith. But that's not what the gospel say. The gospel says he went away sorrowing because he had a lot of stuff. So where was his heart? It wasn't on Jesus, it was on his stuff. And so what does that make him? It makes him an unbeliever, doesn't it? So I, I, again, you have to look at these stories, uh, and that too, that's not a parable necessarily either. It's actual half, and somebody actually asked him that. Okay? Um, you know, uh, it's like... It's like uh, Two, uh, Jesus, uh, when he does, tells a parable about the man who had a lot of stuff, and he decided, he said, whoa, look at me, I'm, I'm good to go. I, I, I'm all ready to, I'm ready to live a long, fat life. And so what is he, I'm going to, tomorrow I'm going to start a new barn. You know, I'm going to build a new barn for all my extra stuff that I can't, don't have room for. And, and uh, uh, Jesus is telling a story, he says, you fool, tonight you're going to die. And God's going to require your soul tonight. Again, what's the point of the story? Is the point of the story that the man's a fool and going to hell because he's just because he has a lot of stuff? No, it's not because he has a lot of stuff. It's because if you read, you read the story, you see that's his only concern. He's not concerned about uh, uh, his faith. He's not concerned about the Bible. He's not concerned about uh, the means of grace. He's only concerned about materialistic stuff, the stuff of this world. See, there's the point. It's not, un and, and it's easy, I, you know, I hear this from people all the time, you know, uh, when they talk about the Bible, you know, Bible's against being rich. No, that's not the case. The Bible's against uh, uh, being rich uh, as the number one priority in your life. You know, if God is number one and, you're, and you wind up rich anyway, okay, you're win-win, okay? Uh, there's no promise that that's always going to be the case. 
But, but if that happens, great, that's wonderful. Okay? But the Bible's not against wealth at all. The Bible is against the misuse of wealth. Just like the Bible's not against alcohol. It's against the misuse of alcohol. Okay? There's a lot of things that the world, uh, in a cursory, just takes a cursory, uh, quickie look at the Bible, or, or hearing some of it, and comes to wrong conclusions. Being poor is great. Boy, being poor is a shoehorn to heaven. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not. And, and you know, being, being rich is, uh, you know, a slide into hell. No, it's not. And again, like I said, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, whatever, lots of rich people in the Bible that were believers. Lots of rich people in the Bible who had lots and lots of stuff and were very, very wealthy and lived very, very nice lives, uh, but also had God as their top priority. So, yeah, you got to be real careful about these things. It's, it's, it's so easy, just, just like I said before, when you hear that, you know, this, all, all, many will be made righteous, and, and, and you, you, re, you, you object right away. Well, that just can't be. It can't be that, that uh, you know, Charlie Manson's uh, sins are, are, are paid for, and he's, it uh, can't be that God looks at Charlie Manson as, as righteous. It can't be that God looks at Charlie Manson as justified. That can't be. No, that can't be. Yes, it is. And, and then, you know, basically God says to Charlie, fine, you want to save yourself? Good luck with that. You want to pay for your own sins? Okay. You don't, you don't, want, to, you don't want Jesus to take your sins away? Okay. They're already gone, but if you're so stupid... That you want to pay for them twice, have at it. Another question, Joe? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's true. And and uh I, I think that uh um it, it, um, it, it's very tragic, frankly. It's very tragic that we have people, I know people, I know personally, I know people who read the Bible constantly. They're forever reading the Bible. I mean, they, they, they have a you know, year through the Bible thing and they, you know, they do it every year, okay? And, and they're as ignorant as you know, a Korean Buddhist. <laughs> because you know, they read it, they read it, they read it, and either they don't ask themselves questions maybe i think a lot of people are afraid frankly this is a, a commentary okay a lot of people are afraid to read the bible and it's not just because they can't pronounce the genealogies okay i know that's that's a problem with some people they get to you know in genesis and so and so begat so and so begat so and so and they oh, can't do that okay which is why i tell everybody yeah just skip that go on but but um the reason people are afraid, and I'm, I'm talking about Christians here, uh, um, the reasons that, that believers even are afraid uh, to read the Bible or to read the Bible uh, with real um, effort, if I guess I can use that word, is because they are afraid of questioning uh, the Bible because they're afraid it will uh, question their faith. Okay. I, I've heard this from numerous people over the years. Well, yeah, I read the Bible. Well, how do you do it? Well, I just, I just read it. Well, do you make notes? Yeah, once in a while. Do you ask questions? Oh, no, I never ask questions. Well, I don't question God's Word. Huh? Well, you should. That's what it's there for. Don't be bashful. You know, that's like when something bad happens and people say, uh, oh, well, you know, it's God's will. Uh, praise be to God. I said, you know, you want to yell at God. You want to shake your fist at God. Please go ahead. You know what? He's got real thick skin. He can handle it. Yes, he can handle it. You want to complain? Complain. Good grief. The Bible's full of people. <laughs> Look at Job, for example. You know, the Bible's full of complainers who are good believers, went to heaven. But they complained. They didn't like 
the way that God did things sometimes. Okay, well, so what? You know, that's it's part of the process. You know, and it's the same thing in reading the Bible. Ask yourself these questions when you when you see something like that. Ask yourself, could this mean? Just ask yourself, could this mean that all human beings are declared holy and righteous in God's eyes? I mean, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini and Hitler and, you know, Mao Zedong. And is that what that means, Pastor? Or just ask yourself and see what kind of conclusion you come to. If you come to a conclusion, no, that can't, that can't be it. Eh? Check with the rest of Scripture and see if it fits. The rest of Scripture says we are saved not by works, but by grace. And again, faith comes into it. Yes, it does. But but the fact that 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 the hell is way overpopulated. The fact that a, a small percentage, a remnant of human beings, of humanity. I mean, I mean, think about it. At the time of the flood, if we're correct in our assumptions, which I think we are, that there are five billion people on the planet when the flood happens, how many of those five billion people go to heaven? as we know. Eight. Eight. If, if, if everybody, including them, would have died right then, okay, without an ark, okay, if everybody would have drowned, the entire world would have drowned, and God started over again with a new Adam and new Eve, okay, that's not what happened, of course, but if he did, how many of those five billion people would have gone to heaven? Eight. And what does Jesus say when he talks about the last day? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the, when the coming of the Son of Man. Think about that for a minute. Let that sink in for a second. Does that tell you that at the last day, the Christian church will be top dog in the world? And believers will be running things? And that there'll be billions of them running around? No, it doesn't, doesn't tell me that. It tells me that we'll be lucky if there's a couple of believers left by the time Jesus comes back. That's what it tells me. So, uh, uh, again, folks, we, read, reading the Bible is great, wonderful. You know, if you just want to read it to read it, that's fine too. But, but really, if, if you want to get something more out of it, okay, ask questions. Ask questions. Okay? And make those questions, make those questions tough. Make them hard. And if you can't answer them yourself or you can't come to an answer that you're satisfied with, that's why you bring them here. Okay? That's why I start every class, except the Saturday one, I start every class with, hey, got, got something on your mind? Let me, let me hear it. Okay? And uh, it's, it's good. For us to do that. Let's finish off the chapter real quick. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. <laughs> now there's a question for you, huh? But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So the law, God brought the law in so that the people would recognize their sin. They would understand how sinful they are, which then again would make them appreciate grace. So that as sin reigned in death, again, in this period of time and really all time, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So again, that's the plan. No, no comment on faith yet. That's the plan. The plan is, as with Adam, so with Jesus. Adam causes everybody to be sinners. Jesus causes everybody to be righteous. All, all. 100%, 100%. The reason the law is given, the first reason the law is given, to show us our sin. Second reason that the Bible is given, show us our Savior, which he's coming to now in uh, later chapters, see? But, but that's, that's the point, that's the point. So with Adam, 
Same with Christ. That's the only point he's making here in this chapter, at the end of chapter 5. That's all he's saying. He's not, he's not saying everybody's going to go to heaven. He's basically saying everybody should go to heaven, but they can go to heaven, but, but uh, not saying everybody does go to heaven. Right. Questions? Uh, we'll go through the notes next time. It's basically I'm saying same, okay. same thing I've been telling you, but just in uh, earlier words. So we be getting a new packet next Tuesday? Uh, probably. You know, we still got this to read through plus 37, 38, and uh, 39. So we got a ways to go, but I have them ready. I have them ready to go. I printed them off just in case we lost power again. So um, I'm going to do that for Sundays too this week. Unless, of course, power goes out. Anything else? All right, let's close. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Amen. Yep. Yes, I read the, the reference, you know, the, the Bible portion that I read in Luke is only a couple pages. Uh -huh. And then the reference, six pages to cover over, you know. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it can be just the opposite. You can read a whole bunch, and, and there, there'd be very little reference. Yeah, 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 I know.